All right. Uh, well, let's go ahead and get this started. So how's everybody doing today? Um, basically, what I'm going to be doing today is giving you a breakdown of all the various types of API gateways you'll found, find out there in the world. Um, you hear a lot of uh, market speak about types of gateways, what they do, how they function, and basically my goal today is to break that all down for you and hopefully you'll be able to find an API gateway that fits into your ecosystem if you do need one. Let's see here. There we go. So who am I? Uh, my name is Jason Nevis. Uh, I basically consider myself a tech evangelist and a technologist. Uh, one thing that my father likes to joke about is that instead of being born with a silver spoon in my mouth, I was born with an integrated circuit in my mouth. Um, I'm a consulting engineer with Tyke. Uh, we are an API management gateway company. Uh, I just recently joined Tyke this past summer, and before that I was a principal developer at Gannett, or more commonly known as USA Today, uh, the newspaper company, where I worked uh, for seven years on the digital transformation of the newspaper's print company into the digital platform that it is today. Uh, I've been in the industry for about three decades now, uh, basically worked from development to data center management to uh, network engineering, and now back to uh, my roots as a consulting engineer. So let's go ahead and get right into the topic. What is an API gateway and why should you use one? So one of the biggest questions, uh, as I've been going to conferences these past few weeks and even jumping on sales calls with customers is, why do I need an API gateway? Um, they have their application and they have their consumers, they expose their application, uh, they might give them a, a simple token or a username and password to access it, uh, but that really doesn't scale too well when you build that in-house yourself. So what you want to do is you want to take an API gateway, put that in front of your services, and make sure that you're protecting yourself a little bit better. So here we have just your typical monolith. You have your consumer, your API, and maybe a couple of data sources behind it. Um, this works well for some organizations, especially if all of that consumer traffic is internal to your network. Um, you really, you know, it, it from, from the standpoint of internal traffic, many people don't think that they need to be protected or they don't need the ability or the capabilities of an API gateway there in order to manage their traffic. They just pretty much run with what they have. But what happens when you start having multiple APIs and multiple data sources uh, for your consumers to come in and access? You start needing the ability to manage that traffic and manage your APIs in a way where you can control which applications uh, have access and what your consumers are doing with that data. So that's where an API gateway would come into play. You basically put the API gateway in front of your APIs and behind your consumers so you can control that traffic that goes to your APIs. And it's especially more important nowadays, now that people are starting to get into mini services or microservices, where they have services that are spread out uh, across their infrastructure and their services spinning up and down constantly, you have to manage the control and the access levels to those data sources, as well as maybe handle legacy data. Well, how do you do that? You put an API gateway in front of that. But then you have additional complexity. Well, you used to have to deal with just a single data center, uh, not much redundancy or geolocation, and with the direction the world is going right now, uh, multiple data centers all over the place, um, you wanna have uh, geo redundancy, east coast and west coast, or even east coast, west coast, Tokyo, Ireland, uh, no matter where you are, your data is all over the place, and you need to manage that access and that's why you would need an API gateway. So what does an API gateway um, perform for you? Security, again, token access, whether it be through uh, OIDC or bearer token, uh, accounting, uh, you wanna be able to get your metrics and your logs from those applications that are being accessed through your API gateway so you can report on that. Uh, consolidation, 
you have a lot of APIs. Maybe you want to take multiple APIs and consolidate that down to a single endpoint and aggregate your data. API gateways perform that function. Traffic routing. You have a lot of APIs again. You want to route traffic, say, between an East Coast and a West Coast data center, or you have a central data center, and you want to be able to manage that traffic through your API gateway so you're always up, you're always running, and you're always making sure that your data stays consistent when your consumers are requesting it. And finally, reducing your app complexity. You don't want to have your developers building these API gateways into their application. It just adds a lot more work for them to maintain, especially when you start scaling out your applications. It just adds a lot more complexity and a lot more stuff for your developers to manage. It's better to have another layer for that um, management so you can have your developers focus on the work that they're supposed to do. So what are some of the typical functions of the API gateway, as I said before? Authentication and authorization, or auth and auth z. Who can access your data, and what data can they access behind the scenes? Again, this is part of offloading a lot of that workload from your developers into the API gateway. Mutual TLS and client certificates. You want to make sure that your data is secure when it's transiting over the wire. You want to make sure that nobody's snooping on your data, especially when it goes from your consumer application to your backend API. Scaling and redundancy. Again, a, a key feature here where you want to make sure that when you have a massive influx of data requests coming into your APIs, that you're able to scale and you have that redundancy should something fail on the back end. Again, and that goes hand in hand with rate limiting and quotas. Maybe you want to monetize your APIs. You want to add service tiers to your APIs. Well, how do you do that? You add rate limits and you add quotas to those APIs so that only certain tiers or, or certain consumers can access your data over a given period of time and they don't abuse your services. Data transformation, especially on the request or the response. Um, one example that I like to use all the time, again, speaking of legacy data, there's a lot of applications out there that are still SOAP-based. Everyone's getting XML data. Well, in today's day and age, everyone's using REST. Well, you can easily just do a data transformation as a middleware within your API gateway to translate directly from XML to JSON. Or the reverse, you want to take a JSON, a REST endpoint, and convert that to XML. That would be a, a perfect use case of your data transformation. Uh, logging. Where is my data going? How is it being accessed? So you want to be able to log that both on the, on the application side, but also on the gateway side. So you can, again, manage that access, see who is accessing it, and report that business intelligence up to your higher ups to make sure that they have full visibility into your APIs. Um, that goes hand in hand with monitoring and metrics. Um, open tracing and now uh, open telemetry, you want to see how are my APIs performing? Where are my APIs communicating? Especially in a microservice world nowadays, um, it is a major pain to be able to figure out, well, I have something failing on the back end. Where is that failure happening? Well, with open tracing or open telemetry in there, you get an ID on each one of those requests, and you can trace that down all the way through your pipeline to make sure that everything is operating properly, what's your latencies, how are things performing, and where your failures are. And then finally, an API gateway gives you a developer portal. So you can actually do self-service on your security. You can monetize your APIs. You can publish a portal and say, well, I want to publish these APIs along with my Swagger documentation. Uh, give those developers or your end consumers the ability to come in, purchase access to an API or request an API key, and automatically service that without you being the middleman in order to manage that. So now we get into some of the terms that you'll find with gateways. So what's a micro gateway? So one thing that I read um, a couple weeks ago, someone defined a micro gateway is a proxy which sits close to the microservice. And 
when you're talking about that proxy, you want to basically have a lot of those same features that your standard API gateway would provide. As you can see, the list here is pretty much the same across the board with a couple asterisks. So let's take a look and see what those asterisks are. So the main difference is between a standard API gateway and a micro gateway. Uh, most of the time, they're deployed as a sidecar within a containerized environment, whether you're using uh, Docker or Kubernetes or you know, any other form of uh, containerization. Usually a lot tighter integration with your microservice. Um, and it's part of a, a service mesh or an ingress ecosystem. So when you deploy your microservice, you're also deploying the gateway along with that and the access controls and all the other features that go with the gateway into that same environment. Much smaller footprint. Again, you want your containers to be as small as possible and you want your gateways to also be as small as possible. One of the caveats though with a micro gateway and this goes across many of the vendors that are out there in the API gateway ecosystem right now, is there are a number of limitations. Um, some of the features that I mentioned before, you may not have access to, like custom coding, functions, or plugins. A lot of those transformations, if you're going from JSON to XML or XML to JSON, you may not have those available because all that micro gateway is there for is to pro provide you a level of security and it doesn't go beyond that. Um, no transformations, again, as I just noted, and limited scalability. Really, most of the time, all you have is a sidecar that deploys with your application. Usually, you only have one instance of it. If that goes down, well, then you pretty much tear down your pod, you respin it back up, and you're back up and running. And that's, again, by design. So let's talk about what an edge gateway is. And as you can see here, it's the same list again. Reason why, when you hear API vendors out there talk about an edge gateway, they're really not talking about a technology. It's market speak. They're just trying to say, well, we have micro gateways, and we have edge gateways, and we have your standard gateway. Well, your edge gateway is just a standard gateway. It's really just where is it located in your ecosystem. Um, again, as I said, less of a technology and more where does it live? usually sits either in front of your consumer or out on your provider's edge, depending on how your infrastructure is set up. So as you can see, standard gateway, edge gateway, not much of a difference there. Micro gateways, on the other hand, you're gonna have some differences in there, mainly around the fact that it's more geared towards containerization, much smaller footprints, and tighter integration with your microservices. So how do you choose what's right for you? That really all comes down to what your application is, how your application is written, and who your audience is for it. Do you need APIs to manage those gateways? Is it manageable through a CI CD pipeline? So can I go ahead and say, well, I need to deploy this gateway or I need to deploy a gateway configuration. Can I throw this in my Jenkins or my Concourse CI and deploy that through a software development lifecycle? Does it have a self-service portal? Where do your services live? Um, many providers nowadays really only offer one option, and that's SaaS. You have to run in their cloud, and you have to run through their services. If you want to run on-premise, you're pretty much out of luck through their service. Or if you do have to run on-premise, they provide a micro-gateway but that micro gateway may not be fully featured to what their SaaS product provides. Um, other options, again, do you want it to run over the open internet? Does the provider offer VPN services or VPC tunnels to be able to proxy your APIs through their service? Do you need containers? Is the gateway available as a sidecar or does it have an ingress controller for your container services? And what cloud provider can I use? Um, many SaaS offerings nowadays are really only offered on one product. Again, uh, just to throw names out there, Amazon's API Gateway. 
When you want to use Amazon's API gateway, you're pretty much relegated to using Amazon and that's it. You don't have much flexibility to go elsewhere. Um, Google's a little bit more flexible, but Amazon's very strict. Um, and again, do I need standard gateways or micro gateways combined? Do I have that option through the provider or the service that I'm choosing? Now the sales pitch. <laughs> so again, as I said, I'm from Tyke. Uh, we are an API gateway and management company. And the full list right there, which I provided at the beginning, is also everything that we provide uh, within our service. Authentication and authorization, MTLS, scaling and redundancy, quota management. Uh, we most recently uh, released uh, policies as products. Uh, so the policies would manage your rate, limit as in rate limiting and quotas, and then you'll be able to release your APIs as an actual product uh, with key management within the product. Data transformations, logging, monitoring metrics, and a self-service portal. So what makes us different from many of the other providers? Again, portable and consistent. Whether you're running on SaaS, hybrid, or on-premise, you're getting the exact same product, the exact same experience, same configuration files, and even the same binaries across the board. So when we run our own SaaS product, if you were to go to on-premise, that same exact on-premise environment, all the binaries, all the configurations, is the exact same thing that we use in our own ecosystem. We eat our own dog food. Runs on bare metal, VM, or container. We're cloud agnostic, so you can run us anywhere. And as I said, same configurations and binaries used everywhere. We're also open source. The gateway itself is open source. We call it the community edition. It's free. You can go up to our GitHub, download that, run it locally, and you're up and running. It's all written in Go. In fact, our entire platform is written in Go. Uh, we're self-contained, and we don't depend on other platforms in order to run our software. So where you may see some other API providers out there where they run their entire ecosystem on top of Nginx, we don't rely on Nginx. We use Go natively, and everything is self-contained. We're also very extensible. So our plugins and our middleware for the transformation layer can be written in native Go, Python, Lua, JavaScript, or pretty much any language that supports gRPC hooks. So again, the message. Don't listen to market speak. Don't listen to buzzwords. Get a POC, look at the products, and try them out. Um, find the solution that fits in your ecosystem. And remember, when you're looking at all the API gateway companies, if you're looking for an API gateway and management, look at all of the options. Because what they may pitch you may not be exactly what is there on the surface. And you may be lulled into a self, uh, uh, sorry, a false sense of security when you're purchasing their product. So again, uh, tyke.io is our website. And if you go up on our GitHub, you can uh, download Docker Compose or Helm Charts uh, to install our product. Just need to go to our site, request a key, and you're off and running. So any questions? Okay. Thank you.